Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's get started. So, uh, on behalf of the local organizers and the CERN theory department, I would like to welcome uh, all the participants, the members of the scientific committee, and especially our distinguished speakers to the CERN Winter School of 2018. So, uh, we hope uh, you will enjoy your stay at CERN and you will find the school uh, useful and inspiring. So before we start the morning session, uh, let me make some practical comments. Um, uh, as you know, the scientific program consists of uh, five sets of lectures, uh, of uh, five different uh, subjects, uh, four lectures each, as well as a special uh, one-hour lecture on uh, beyond the standard model physics, which will uh, take place tomorrow. And you are uh, encouraged to ask questions during the lectures. Uh, if, you, if you want to ask a question, please use a microphone that is on your seat. Just press the button to activate it, ask the question, and then turn it off again. And uh, you will also have uh, the opportunity to ask uh, more detailed questions during the discussion sessions in the, in the afternoons, and you're uh, encouraged to attend. <clears throat> so apart from the scientific uh, program, uh, we also have some social activities. Um, this afternoon at 6 o'clock, there will be a reception, which will take place uh, right in front of the auditorium, and you're all invited. Um, tomorrow evening, there will be the dinner of the school uh, at restaurant number one. Uh, we ask you to sign up for it. Uh, if you haven't done so and you still want to join, uh, please uh, let me know. Uh, on Wednesday afternoon, there will be no lectures and uh, there will be a ski trip and uh, um, a visit to the Atlas uh, detector. Um, those of you who signed up for Atlas, uh, you must have received an email uh, yesterday about uh, the time slot that you have been assigned and we will give you more details about uh, where and when we will meet exactly uh, after we hear back from the guides. Uh, if you don't want to, to participate, if you have changed your mind and you cannot attend for whatever reason, uh, please uh, let us know because then somebody else can, can perhaps take, take your place. Uh, so the badges, uh, you will receive your badges a little bit later today and uh, you should uh, uh, keep them on you. If you want to uh, uh, leave the campus and come back in, you need your badge. Um, okay, so I think uh, this is it. Uh, so after these practicalities, we're ready to start uh, the morning session with our first speaker, Freddy Cachoazzo, who will be telling us about scattering amplitudes in various dimensions. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And... Let me thank the organizers for inviting me to be here. And, well, I'm going to be telling you about scattering amplitudes in various dimensions. So I thought we could start with some motivations. So this is the first time the motivation for the first part of the title is the place we're in. Okay, so I don't have to give you motivations for that part because we all know where we are, we all know what's happening here, but maybe instead of motivating why we have to compute scattering amplitudes, I thought I could say, I could just say that um, CERN also provides a motivation for all scientists to keep doing what they are doing because at the risk of sounding, uh, going around the topic, maybe I can say, I can use the opportunity to say that in the world that we're living in, you could ask, well, why do science, why do physics, if everything seems to be kind of a mess? Well, but CERN shows that putting efforts together, mankind can do spectacular things. So I think that's a very good motivation for keep doing what we're doing, okay? Now, the part that requires motivation, really, is this one, especially because we are here. People would ask, why should we do things in various dimensions? After all, we have very good experimental evidence that we live in four dimensions. Well, but we also have three, four, and six. Well, there is something in between as well, and we can even go higher, but these are the dimensions that we're going to discuss in these lectures. And perhaps we will also do something in any number of dimensions. Now, as I said, four dimensions doesn't need any motivations, okay? 
However, in order to motivate the other ones, or at least the six-dimensional one, let me explain that massless particles are very special. So as you all know, once you have massless particles that carry spin, or more precisely, helicity in four dimensions, they are very constrained objects, and their representation under the Poincaré group requires us to use or to introduce redundancies in order to have a local description. And all that redundancy allows us to fix or to constrain scattering amplitudes dramatically, so much so that for massless particles, sometimes it's possible to guess the answer. Well, that sounds very good. But we also know that in four dimensions, we're also interested in massive particles. So in four dimensions, we also want massive particles. So what if we start, start in dimension six with massless particles, and then do some dimensional reduction, and go to four dimensions? In that way, you can get a formalism, or you can use the same techniques that you develop for massless particles in order to learn what happens for massive particles in four dimensions. Now, how about three dimensions? Well, I was planning to make a joke, but it doesn't quite work, because I was planning to say that in three dimensions, you can ask Juji. But just five minutes before the talk, he told me that he's going to mainly discuss two dimensions. So, uh, <laughs> but well, I mean, that was, I already had this plan, so I, I don't know what to say. Uh, <laughs> so maybe you can ask him to, to bump up the lectures to, to three dimensions. OK? Well, this was part of the joke, so <clears throat> I'll try to give you some motivation later. OK, very good. So that's the motivation, and something happened. Yeah, oh, so that's in revenge for the, for the joke. Okay. okay. I'll take that as, an, as, an <laughs> as a sign of aggression. <laughs> okay, very good. So <clears throat> the observation is that you all learn how to compute the scattering amplitudes using Feynman diagrams. You'd say, well, we're probably wasting our time here because we have Feynman diagrams. But as I said, for particles that carry helicity, say in four dimensions, we have to introduce redundancies. So what we do is to take Feynman diagrams, we sum over them, and we have redundancies the standard one that you all know is the redundancy in the description that we have when we try to describe a particle of helicity plus minus one using a polarization vector we know that this is too much information that is not relevant so we have to mod out by the longitudinal part okay now individual Feynman diagrams are not gauge invariant. But there is something good about them, and that's why we learn Feynman diagrams. But they make locality of the S matrix or locality of the scattering amplitude manifest. Now you can probably guess what the goal of this lecture is going to be. 
we want to switch things around. So Feynman diagrams, you compute a scattering amplitude by summing Feynman diagrams. Each Feynman diagram is local by itself, but it's not gauge invariant. So what do you think we want to do? Well, we want to compute the scattering amplitudes using some other objects. So we're going to be summing over other kinds of objects, and we want to reverse the roles of locality and gauge invariance. So the goal is to express scattering amplitudes as a sum over objects which are manifestly gauge invariant but not local. So that's the price you will have to pay. So something has to give, and in this case, it will be locality. OK, very good. Now, once we have succeeded, let me tell you what the application I have in mind, just also part of the motivation. So let's see. So the application has to do with some strange quantum field theories that appear as effective descriptions. Well, if you know string theory, they are not strange, but in general, they might look strange. So in a string theory, well, you probably have heard about very famous objects known as D-brains. And of course, you have seen the picture of a, of a D-brain, which is some sub-manifold in space-time where open strings can end. Okay? The D stands for Dirichlet. These are the boundary conditions for the, for the endpoints of the open strings so that they are attached to the D-brain. Now, what I want to think about here is the following. So this is something that has P space-time, space dimensions. And it has one time. So this one is called a PD brain. Now, the endpoints of the string carry a U1 charge. So there must be a gauge field living in the word volume of this D brain that lives inside some big space-time dimension. <clears throat> some space-time of higher dimensions, this object lives there. So there must be some gauge field, there must be some scalar fields describing the motion of this D-brain inside its embedding space. But for the time being, let's only concentrate on the gauge field. And we all know how to construct the action for a gauge field in p plus 1 dimensions. So here, the dimensionality of the space-time is p plus 1. So what do you think? Should we erase and then use the other blackboard so that, is that what people usually do? Well, in any case, you won't be able to see what I wrote there, right? So, yeah. so it's probably. Um, okay, so. Can you lower the second blackboard? <laughs> lower the second? I don't know. I'll, okay, that's the problem of being the first speaker, right? So yeah, I have to figure out everything. Okay. You remember the picture of the D brain? <laughs> okay, maybe let's just do this. All right.
Okay, if we all know how to write down the action for a gauge field, oh, this is a question. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> okay, very good. So we all know how to write down the action for For a gauge field, especially if it's abelian, right? If it carries just a U1, all we have is a U1 gauge field. This is our free theory. This is Maxwell. But the D-brain, in the case of the D-brain, we will have these strings doing many things. So just having Maxwell will be extremely boring. So this object has to be enhanced to allow the interactions of this gauge field with itself but they interact in ways that don't resemble the non-abelian gauge fields that you're familiar with. Instead, we have a theory of interacting photons. We still have a U1 gauge group. It, it doesn't get enhanced to be UN because I'm considering a single D-brain. And instead, we're going to get an action that looks something like this. Let me write it. Uh, Okay, so it looks a little bit strange, but if you expand in G, the leading order will be this term, and this is something called the born infill theory. And you would say, well, isn't that strange? Why is it called the born infill theory? How come they didn't know about they didn't know about D brains in 1930? But the reason they wrote this down was because they were looking for a theory where the strength of the, of, the, of, a, of the electromagnetic interactions will have a way of shutting down by itself because they didn't like the problem of the self-energy of the electron. It turns out that this object will have a maximum value for the field strength, but it also turns out to be the theory that describes or the effective theory of these D-brains once you have a single deep brain, this is the Lagrangian that governs the structure, okay? This Lagrangian, we can also write it in a fancier form, if you wish, where F is a two form. Now, this is not the theory that we want to consider. The reason is that, well, we have Lagrangian, we know what to do, but how about if we consider M theory. So if we have M theory, M theory is something that also contains, as you know, M theory is, a, is, is supposed to be a theory that contains string theories as particular cases or particular limits of it. So M theory contains two fundamental objects. It contains an M2 brain, and it contains an M5 brain. Okay, now, this M2 brain lives in how many dimensions? So what's the word volume? What's the dimensionality of the word volume? Yes, it's three, because we follow the same convention as, the other, as in the other case. So this P means the number of space dimensions, so this lives in three dimensions. And then, of course, I don't have to answer this one lives in six dimensions. Now, the three-dimensional theory here would be the motivation for studying three dimensions. And likewise, this would be the motivation that I want to use in these lectures to study six dimensions. But let me just give you a hint of why this, is, why this would be an interesting target for the description that I have in mind. The reason is the following. As we saw, in the case of the D brains, we have a gauge field, which is a one form, because the open strings can end there. And from the point of view of the D brain, the end point of the string is a particle. So we need a gauge field that couples to that particle. In the case of the M5 brain, what we have is actually a membrane that ends there. So what we have on the word volume is a string so the object that has to couple to the string is not a one form. It has to be what? 
It has to be a two form. So instead, we need an abelian two form as our gauge field. So the gauge field is now going to be replaced by a two form, and the field strength is going to be a three form. And you would say, well, no problem whatsoever. I can write down the action. So at least the analog of the Maxwell part, right? So no problem. But there is a problem. The problem is that these theories are also supersymmetric, and SUSY implies that this object just by itself is, has too many components to be part of the super multiplet that you need. So you have to require that H is self-dual. And why is that a disaster? Yes? Because the Lagrangian is zero. That's very good. And why is the Lagrangian zero? Well, because if you have two, three forms, and you have the wedge product of them, and you exchange the order, you pick up a minus sign. So this thing is also equal to minus this, because they are three forms. But if we impose a self-dual condition, we get that the object is equal to minus itself, and this implies that the Lagrangian is zero. So it seems that there is no way to write down a Lagrangian, at least that is Lorentz invariant, that will describe this theory, even the free theory. Never mind the interacting theory that is supposed to be the analog of the Born-Infeld theory for the D-brains. So recently, Matt Heidemann, John Schwartz, and Konga Wen, 17, 10, 02, 170. Using the techniques that I'm going to explain, they were able to write down, even though we don't know the Lagrangian explicitly or a manifestly Lorentz invariant way of writing down this Lagrangian for the interacting theory or even for the free theory, they were able to write what is a conjecture for the full S matrix for any number of particles and any kind of fields that appear in the interactions. So, remember, this Morinfeld theory, as well as the theory that if we knew how to write, would be the one that we would write here. These are effective field theories. So, we're going to treat them as such. And when I mean the full S matrix, what I mean is a full three level S matrix. So I think this is very exciting. This is one of the ex first examples where the power of the formalism is, is showing its teeth. It's saying, well, there is something that we can do. All right, so now it's time to get to work, okay? So I made a promise, so if I don't hurry up, we are not gonna make it there. So, oh, no. We should erase this first, right? Oh, it's, 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 it feels, it, it just doesn't feel right to erase something you just, you just wrote. Okay, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, let's do. Ah, huh, fancy. Okay. So, how are we planning to conquer this theory for which we don't even know the Lagrangian? Now it's not even a matter of saying that you have, you have a theory, you know how to compute in principle using Feynman diagrams, but there are too many Feynman diagrams. That's, that's the usual excuse for, for explaining what I'm going to explain. But in this particular case, it's even more exciting. It's not even that, uh, that you're gonna be using supercomputers and so on. Here, even having the Lagrangian is not, uh, is not available. 
So the strategy is the following. We have to make simple everything that, we can, that can possibly be made simple, OK? And the first thing is going to be the kinematics. The second is going to be the dynamics. And the third is going to be, which for the example we are going to discuss is not useful, but maybe in future applications it will which is the color structure. So let's start with the dynamics. With the kinematics, sorry. OK, so we're going to draw our scattering amplitude. We have particles k1, k2, all the way up to kn. So this is a scattering amplitude of m particles in d dimensions. Now, the scattering amplitude, you would say that it's a function of the momenta, but of course it's not a function, right? It sounds uh, strange, but no, it cannot possibly be a function. And the reason is that it has to be translation invariant. So when you apply the translation generator to the amplitude, you're supposed to pick up a factor that goes as the exponential of e to the i, the translation vector, times the momentum, or the sum of the momentum of the particles. So for the amplitude to do that, so under a translation, the amplitude has to be, has to satisfy this property. But no function does that, right? It's impossible to have a function that does this. So it has to be a distribution. And it's a distribution localized on the support of what we call momentum conservation. So I'm going to use, as well, something else here that we don't usually write down in, in quantum field theory. But I'm going to put part of the wave functions of the particles as definition of the scattering amplitude. by imposing the on-shellness condition on the momentum. Again, we're going to be considering massless particles. So let me write it again. And finally, we have the standard scattering amplitude, the one that you know and love. For example, if we were doing lambda phi cube, just a scalar field theory, so, and we have four particles, what would be the scattering amplitude? So let's, just so that we have our minds in the right place. So consider an interaction Lagrangian of the form phi cube. What would be the four particle amplitude? Anyone? So we would have to write down all possible Feynman diagrams, right? The Feynman rules are very simple. There is only one vertex, the cubic coupling with a coupling lambda. And for four particles, we can just put two of those cubic couplings connected by a single propagator in all possible ways. So what are all the possible ways? So you can have, you can have particles one and two, three and four, plus one, three, two, four, plus one more that I'll allow you to write it. And they all come with a coupling lambda times the propagators. And we usually use the notation for Mandelstam invariance, S, T, and U. OK? So that's the object that we will be thinking about when we think about this guy here. Of course, we're going to be doing, we want to, we want to study more interesting theories. But it's good to have in mind what this guy actually is in particular case. OK. So now, what do we have here? We have D linear equations, and we have N quadratic 
constraints. So if you want to produce data that corresponds to the physical scattering of M particles, say you want to experiment with something, not an actual experiment like here, because there you don't get to choose. But uh, if you were trying to implement in, in mathematics, say, some scattering amplitudes and you want to check, you will have to generate vectors that satisfy momentum conservation and that are on your own shell. So you will have to solve delinear constraints and n quadratic constraints. Wouldn't it be better if, again, we could switch these two things somehow? Especially if you're working with a fixed dimensionality of space-time and the number of particles is arbitrary, it would be great if we could swap the two things. So let's consider four dimensions. So our goal would be to replace these n quadratic constraints by four quadratic constraints, and then these guys by linear constraints. So how do we do it? Well, it's actually not that complicated. So we take every momentum vector, and we produce a two by two matrix by using the Pauli matrices. So let me lower this index and put this index up. This is a two by two matrix. Now, sigma, the Pauli matrices, is the four vector made out of Pauli matrices. The notation alpha, alpha dot for the components is easy to explain. The idea is that the Pauli matrices actually transform under three representations of the Lorentz group. They transform under the vector representation, under the left-handed spinner, and the right-handed spinner representation. Okay? And that's why they can be used to translate from one representation to another. So we can transform a spinner, transform a vector into a bispinner. And this is the formulation that we want to discuss. Now, if you have any vector k, this matrix is fairly easy to write. Let me write it for you explicitly so that you see that there is no hidden, hidden variables anywhere. OK? That's the matrix k. Now, the determinant of this matrix happens to be what? Happens to be equal to the norm of the vector. So in the cases of massless particles, where we have everyone on shell, what we find is that they can be described by matrices, two by two matrices, whose determinant vanishes. And what, what's the meaning of a met when you have a determinant that vanishes? So what's the meaning, about, what's the meaning of that condition on, the, say, the columns of the matrix? What does it imply? So let's say that this is zero. So this implies something on the columns of the matrix. Columns. Oh, I always get confused. <laughs> columns. Is that correct? Excellent. So columns are what, then? <laughs> yes? Excellent. So isn't this nice? So the quadratic constraints have become linear constraints. Okay. Well, let's solve them. If they are linear, we should be able to solve them. So how do we do it? Well, our matrix K, if two columns in two dimensions are linearly dependent, that means that they are actually proportional to each other. So let me call this column A and B the elements of this column. So they have to be proportional to the elements of this column. So the constant of proportionality for this one, let me call it A tilde and, B t and A tilde here. So I'm multiplying this column by A tilde and this column by B tilde. So this is the most general 
two by two matrix whose determinant is equal to zero. It also happens that I can write it as AB times A tilde B tilde. So people like to give a name to this object, to this two component object, is called lambda. And this two component object is called lambda tilde. And the nice thing about this object is that, as you see, if you match the indices that I wrote down here, this two component object carries the indices that transform as a positive chirality spinner, and this one as a negative chirality spinner. So every momenta will now be replaced by this matrix K that is constructed out of two spinners. So if you give me, instead of the momenta, you give me the two spinners, this object is automatically on shell. So we have solved all the quadratic constraints in one go. However, we have to go back to momentum conservation. Well, let me write it here. So momentum conservation will imply what? Implies is that the sum of all these objects has to be zero. But how many constraints are there? Alpha and alpha dot go from what to what? They go from one to two. So we have two values for alpha and two values for alpha dot. So we have four constraints. In other words, what we are replacing is the sum of all these vectors by the sum of all these matrices. And every component of the two by two matrix or the sum of all those two by two matrices has to be equal to zero. And that's what I'm writing here. So we succeeded. We have replaced the four linear constraints by linear, by n linear constraints, and vice versa, and we have gotten four quadratic constraints, okay? Now, you would say that there is something strange here, because if you give me these two spinners, and someone else gives me two spinners related to these ones, by the multiplication of a non-zero number and its inverse, these two give rise to the same momentum k. So there is a redundancy we have introduced. So have you ever heard something like, well, try to look for things that leave a momentum invariant. Well, you probably have heard those words. Now let's try even better. Imagine that these guys are really solutions of the Dirac equations, and they are spinners. And when you perform a Lorentz transformation, they pick up a phase. And now we are looking for Lorentz transformations that leave that momentum k invariant. That would be the definition of what? Yes? That would be the definition of the little group of this particle. Excellent. So that's what I want you to do today. One of the exercises for today is to review what the little group is in four and in six dimensions. Okay. So review an exercise for today. It's not an exercise. It's really homework. That's my convention for homework. So review the concept of the little group in four and six dimensions. OK. Very good. So what to do next? I think next would be natural to try the same thing, but for six dimensions. I mean, now we're on a roll, so we did. We succeeded so much. I mean. It was a great success to do it in four dimensions, so why don't we do it in six? 
And here I want to, let's see, so this guy, Okay, and of course I forgot to erase this. No. All right, so how do we do this in six dimensions? It seems that everything we did there was very four dimensional and that only works in four dimensions. Well, that's true, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but then we'll have to come out with something else for six dimensions. So let's do d equals six. So let's consider the Euclidean Lorentz group in six dimensions. Just to think about the algebra, but it doesn't really matter. So it's just to understand how the representation theory will work in a, in a way that is easy to remember. So SO6 is isomorphic to also a very simple group, which is exactly SU4. So we want to start with a vector representation and see if there is any way to convert it into something that uses a spinners. After all, that's exactly what allows us to do the magic in four dimensions, maybe expressing the vector in terms of spinners would also allow us to do something nice in six dimensions. So here we have the fundamental representation of SU4, which is four dimensional, and we also have the anti-fundamental representation, which is also four dimensional. And it's okay because we have two different spinner representations. Now, if we want to get the vector representation, Let's start with a tensor product of two fundamental representations and see what we get. So we get the anti-symmetric product and the symmetric part. This one has six components or six dimensional and this one is 10 dimensional. So the vector of SO6 is actually the anti-symmetric of SU4. So that gives us a hint for what is it that we want to do. So we want to take our vector, and what do we want to do? Well, we want to dot it, or we want to contract it, with the six-dimensional Pauli matrices this time. But this time, they carry the same kind of index. So these A and B indices are indices that go from one to four and they are in the fundamental representation, and therefore we need this to be anti-symmetric. And this is our new matrix, KAB. It's a four by four anti-symmetric matrix, okay? Now your first exercise is to show that the norm of this vector is not the determinant of the matrix K. Ah, you thought that you had to prove that. <laughs> no. Well, let's do the exercise together. This, this much is so simple. Why is it obvious that this cannot possibly be true? Anyone? Yes? That's true, exactly. That's a way of saying that this has the dimensions of four powers of k, while this one has two powers of k. So this cannot possibly be right. But this is four and this is two. If we could only take the square root, wouldn't that be fantastic? That, that, I mean, that wishful thinking only works very rarely, but, uh, but how about in this case? You say, well, now it has the right dimensions. But K is an anti-symmetric matrix. Do you know any property of anti-symmetric matrices that will help us 
in this case. Since k is anti-symmetric, it turns out, if you don't believe me, just put it in mathematics and play for with two by two, four by four, and keep going until, until you are convinced. So put those things in there, compute the determinant, and tell Mathematica to factor it. And to your surprise, you will see that it always becomes a perfect square. So it turns out that the determinant of an anti-symmetric matrix is the square of an object called the Fafian of the matrix. which is a polynomial in the coefficients of the matrix, okay? Now your exercise is to show that this is the Fafian of the matrix K. Now, I'm gonna write it for you in terms of the components of the matrix K. As promised, it has dimension and now, what we're doing is setting this to zero, right? Because we're dealing with massless particles. Remember that the whole deal was that we were doing six dimensions because it was easier to do it was easy to do massless particles. Now, can we repeat the same story as before? Can we translate this into a constraint or a linear constraint on the components or something? Does anybody know the answer? Well, if you know the answer, don't tell me, okay? If you don't know the answer, try to think and then tell me. Well, don't worry, because I didn't know the answer either. So when you see something like this, so what I like to tell people is that, well, you see something like this, you, you say, well, this is something that surely mathematicians know, right? So you go and ask a mathematician, so have you ever seen something like this? And then sometimes they come out with very good answers that are useless, and sometimes with answers that, <laughs> that are actually useful. So in this case, they will come out with an answer that sounds like this. So they would say, sure, I have seen things like this, and this is very easy. Think about the case as components of a six-dimensional vector, but the constraint, as you see, take this guy to be, let's call it V. This constraint, if it's solved by B, is also solved by b times a number, right? That means that your space is not really C6, but CP5, the, comp the projective complex space, CP5. And now, clearly, you have a quadric living in CP5, so that must be a Grassmannian of two planes in four dimensions. And that's the kind of things that is useless to you at the, moment, at the time, because you don't know anything that you're talking about. So they would say, you now have this quadric in CP5, and this is also known as the Grassmannian of two planes in four dimensions. And you would say, well, okay, fine, so that's all. I can see you're excited, uh, but uh, can, you, can you give me something more precise, something that I can work with? And you say, okay, fine, so let me tell you what the Grassmannian of two planes G24 is. So they will come out with what, what could be the kindergarten version of what this Grassmannian is. And the kindergarten version, they will say, well, construct an element in that Grassmannian can be constructed by writing a four, a two by four matrix, okay? This guy is a vector in four dimensions, so let's call this guy a vector. So let's call it V1 and V2. So V1 and V2 are vectors in four dimensions. 
but they are, you only have two of them. So they span a plane. They span a two plane in four dimensions. So that two plane in four dimensions is great. I can describe it with these two vectors, but if all you're interested in is in the two plane, then any change of basis should allow you or should give you the same point. So you have to take these two guys and mod them out by a change of basis. Actually, um, okay, let's call them. Any GL2 transformation will give you the same plane, right? Okay, so your friend will tell you, well, take the collection of all these matrices, modulo GL2 transformations, and that's your space. Say, so, okay, that's very good. But then how is, can this possibly be related to this case? That's what I want, right? So you want to push a little more and say, but that's very nice. I like these two by, two, these two by four matrices. In fact, I like them so much that I'm going to denote them as lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, and lambda four. So this would be the columns. They are two-dimensional vectors. We have four two-dimensional vectors here. So let's call them lambda. So you say, how are these things related to these ones? So they would say, well, the way this relation is satisfied is if you impose the following. Define the determinant of the two by two submetrix constructed from column A and column B, define this to be your matrix or your element AB, okay? So what do I mean by this? Well, we mean you take column A with index A, say, column B with index B, and you do the contraction with AB with anti-symmetric two by two metrics, and that computes the determinant. People also denote this like this. Okay? Now the exercise for you is to show that this identity is actually true. Once you write KAB as these brackets, then this identity holds, okay? So this is true if KAB is given by this combination. Okay. Good, so once again, we have been able to replace every single quadratic constraint imposing the onshellness condition in terms of linear constraints. And the constraints were coming from the vanishing of the Fafian. Now, do we have anything else, any redundancy that could play the role of the little group as we saw in four dimensions? In four dimensions, when we describe our objects in terms of spinners, we found that they had a redundancy by a rescaling that led to the same momentum. In this case, what would be the redundancy? It's almost written on the board, but it's not quite correct. You can, if you say GL2, you're incorrect. So what would be the redundancy? Yeah, but remember that what we want is a transformation that gives rise to the same momentum vector, okay? So indeed, any GL2 transformation will lead to something that satisfies this equation. But we want something even stronger. We want a transformation that leaves the momentum invariant, okay? Not even up to a rescaling. It has to be invariant, okay? So you're almost there, right? So if it's not GL2, what would it be? SL2C, exactly. So take any of these objects that depends on two elements, 
I mean, it depends on, it has another index A. I multiply this by a matrix to produce a new one, where this matrix is an element of SL2C. And of course, the determinant will be invariant. Now, what's the little group of massless particles in six dimensions? You don't have to know because I told you to review it, okay? So, but tomorrow you have to. A hint, it contains SL2C, okay? Very good. So, let's see, so we have five more minutes. Okay, in the remaining five more minutes, let's, uh, let's actually give you some more homework. No, it's not HM. Okay. Uh, no, I'm not going to tell you what happens for the Lorentz. <laughs> no, but the whole construction works through equally well for Lorentz signature. What happens if you use four bar instead of four? Oh, you're giving away the story, right? <laughs> so there was nothing special about the four. I could use the four bar. And then I would end up with a description in terms of the opposite chirality spinners. And they would have another SL2C as the redundancy. Now you know what the little group of, lot of massless particles in six dimensions is, right? Okay, your homework is to do this, repeat all this. for dimensions eight and 10. And if you succeed, and it's beautiful, and it works great, then you write a paper, okay? Excellent. The, there are papers, but uh, that's, why, that's why I was careful to say, if it works beautifully, everything is nice, and. Well, can anyone point out why would it be difficult as you go higher in dimensions to do something like that? The what? That's, that's actually true, yes, yes. But for, for a, in eight dimensions, there is also a beautiful accident that happens. But uh, yeah, that's true. So if you go too high, then, then definitely there are no more accidents and life gets hard. But uh, it's also, the, the problem is also that the number of components in, in the spinor representation grows dramatically. And that's precisely what you're saying, that for lower dimensions, the accidents allow you to do things that you couldn't in higher. Now, let's introduce a topic for tomorrow, which is dynamics. Okay, I hope I convince you that we have trivialized the kinematics in four and six dimensions. So now let's do dynamics and see how far we can go. So what is dynamics? So I want to think about dynamics, or I, the way I like to think since I'm giving the talk, I'm free to, to choose how I want to think about dynamics, right? Um, so as the structure of the, scatter, of the singularities of the scattering amplitude, okay? So the scattering amplitude is supposed to have, at three level, is supposed to have poles, and that's what locality tells us. It tells us what kind of poles it can have, and unitarity tells us about the residues of those poles. So I want to also trivialize that as much as possible. And in order to do that, we're going to start with a scalar field theory. We already have one amplitude written there. So we see the poles, we see the structure, and now you would say, well, we did all that work for the kinematics in order to introduce the little group and trivialize 
tons of things, but the scalar particles don't have any interesting transformations under the little group. So instead, we're going to use Mandelstam invariants. So what I want to do is to write down something so that I can also give you homework for tomorrow. So let me introduce these variables, S, A, B, which are given by this, okay? So you're familiar with them. Now, all this complicated thing about having linear constraints, quadratic constraints, and all that, in the case of a scalar theory, our scattering amplitude, a n, is just a function of these Mandelstam invariants. So if we can translate those conditions in terms of just these Mandelstam invariants, we don't even have to think about the momentum vectors. All we have to do is to think about the S's. So I want to study the space of all such objects, and they naturally make an M by M matrix, right? S11, S12, 13, 1N, 2-1, to two. Now, since we're working with massless particles, okay, again, massless, this implies that the, const the diagonals are all zero. So let's count how many kinematic invariants we have here. Of course, my definition implies that this matrix is symmetric. So we have a symmetric matrix, therefore it has n times m plus 1 over 2 components. But all the diagonals are 0. Now you put this again in mathematics, you do factor, and you find that this is n times m minus 3 over 2. And this is the space of independent Mandelstam invariants if you are in high enough dimensions. Now, if the dimensionality of a space-time is small compared to the number of particles, you can have accidental linear constraints on the vectors, right? Not all the vectors, if you have 10 vectors in four dimensions, they will not be linearly independent, and therefore these constraints will not work. So part of your homework, again, is show that in D equals four, only 3m minus 10 are independent. OK? All right, so what else do I want to say? Yeah, so the preview of what we're going to do tomorrow is the following. We have these objects. Now think about four particles. Oh. Also, another part, another part of the homework is to show that momentum conservation, so we have imposed the on shell nest condition in a trivial way, right? All the elements in the diagonal are zero. So we're done with that one. So the difficult part is done. Now, momentum conservation becomes linear constraints on these metrics. What do you think they, they impose? Do you know? Exactly. So the sum of all the rows or the sum of all the columns have to be zero. In other words, momentum conservation implies that the sum of all the rows or all the columns must be zero. OK? Now, for four particles, our formula tells us that we only have two independent variables. And the reason is that S12 plus S13 plus S14 has to be zero. And this is what we usually call S. This one is more controversial, but I will call it U. And this one, I'm going to call it T. And the last thing that I want to do is to, to do the following, to draw a picture that we're going to draw tomorrow as well. Uh, 
And the picture is the following. I'm going to draw the space K4. So this is my space K4. I'm choosing S and T as my independent variables. Now I look at my amplitude over there. Remember the amplitude that we wrote down? Let's show it a little bit. It's in that corner, right? And I'm going to draw all the poles, or the places where this amplitude has poles. And the places are here, where T is equal to zero. Here, where S is equal to zero. And last, here, where u is equal to zero, okay? Now you see that my space K4 is just isomorphic to R2. It's just a plane. And the plane doesn't know anything about where the singularities are. So the plane couldn't, couldn't care less about the fact that there is something special that is supposed to happen here, here, or there. And therefore, my conclusion is that this space doesn't know much physics, okay? So the goal for tomorrow the idea would be to find a space that knows more physics than KM. Okay? So I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot, Freddie. Uh, are there any questions? OK, if there are no questions, then uh, we're going to take a coffee break until uh, 11 o'clock. See you then.